Alrighty, welcome back to History 112. Um, this is Jacob Parks, once again, your instructor for this course. Um, coming to you via the internet uh, to talk to you a little bit about our second week lecture. Uh, before we get into that, I just wanted to address a few things. Um, first and foremost, I was very impressed with everybody's discussion board. Look at that, 62 whole posts. I was very excited to see a very engaging conversation about the readings y'all did. Um, and I loved how you, you shared your difficulties understanding some of the articles, which, um, yeah, some of them are difficult, and uh, they, their arguments were a little difficult to understand. So it was nice to know that each of you had some, uh, had some reassuring thoughts for your classmates, and I really appreciate that. So let's just be mindful to keep that going throughout the semester to offer tips and tricks on how to better prepare for this course. Um, and as you can see here, this is um, my version of what is out there. Um, and remember, part of the component of writing a discussion board is not only your post, but also you responding to two of your classmates' posts. Um, <clears throat> and some of you all did not do that. Um, I am aware how many total posts you've written regarding week one discussion board. Um, and just for the sake of clarification, I am I did not give you partial credit for this past week if you only wrote one. But any week after this, such as the discussion board I'm going to create regarding this lecture, you have to write one discussion board personally about answering the questions, whatever but also respond to two of your classmates. It's really important that we engage with one another um, so we can you know, foster a sense of community and discussion. Um, even though it's a little difficult to do so online, we're still able to create a really engaging conversation about the course. Um, and please do so via Blackboard. Um, if you have any problems, um, once again, address me, but if they're like, that's if they're more course content related. Other than that, um, unfortunately, my electronic capabilities are very limited outside of doing this. I feel very accomplished knowing that I can record all this for you. Um, but outside of that, reach out to Jolt um, to get some technical assistance, whatever you need. Um, let me see if there's any other housekeeping things that we need to be aware of. Um, I like always course content is here. We're week two now. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, technically, this course starts at chapter 15 um, for the textbook. But I really wanted us to consider the cities and empires in the Americas, which are covered in chapter 14 of volume one. So that's why I've uploaded my copy of that. Um, I know it's not the best scanned copy, but it's something, right? Gives you something else, another resource to absorb the information. That's what all this is about. Um, but when in doubt, also be sure to check out the ebook here. All right. I've noticed that some of you have created ebook accounts connected to the course, and that's wonderful. And um, just be sure to use all those capabilities. Um, I can pull it up real quick. Keep in mind that mine's gonna be a little bit different than yours. See, it shows me all of my sections here. There, I can pull up the students, but that's fine. We don't need to do that. Um, I had a representative from McGraw-Hill come into my class, my in-class class today, and showed us the smart book, which is a really, really fascinating tool. Um, long story short, it really, the smart book, um, it learns how you learn. So let's just see where you're doing cities and empires in the Americas. So I'll give it one second. And then it's a little bit different than it see has more interaction on the left hand side, gives you an idea of the pages, uh, outline the in chapters. This exercise. Oh, she's talking. I don't, I don't want her to talk right now. But um, you can engage with the text in different ways, such as taking quizzes. See down here is practice. You haven't. She's talking again. I don't want her to talk. Uh, you can see you can answer this. See the aristocratic elite. 
Tawanaka appeared to be continually blank to attract pilgrims. Let's just say offer that. And maybe you feel very, very confident about this. Maybe a little bit confident, not really confident, or no idea at all. So let's just do that. No idea at all. Yeah, got the wrong one. That's fine. But what's going to happen is that the more and more down here you progress through this exercise, the book literally learns what you need help with. So if I answer enough of these, go back to reading, it will literally highlight the text for me. Um, let's close that. Um, personally, for me, I think this is a little too interactive. Um, I, I like old-fashioned hand textbooks, but you see here it is. This is what I was wanting them to do. Right there. See, so it automatically highlights areas for you to concentrate on. Um, click to view learning resources. We could do that. Um, a slide strip or a slide. Um, very interactive, so be sure to play around with that, okay? Um, other than that, um, let's see, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Okay, so let's just get right into the meat of this lecture, okay? Uh, here we are. Cities in America, city and cities and empires in America, excuse me. So this chapter begins with an introduction um, to orient yourselves about, not only about the sources with which we use to discuss and understand the Americas at this time, but also how relatively new these ideas are. Um, starting in 1978, a power company working in Mexico City actually uncovered a, um, a startling discovery. They were digging a trench for an electrical cable, and they unearthed a giant stone disc showing the dismembered body of a woman. Uh, long story short, that, that dismembered body of a woman was a uh, central part of the early um, <clears throat> Aztec um, mythology at that time. Uh, so they got some people to recognize, oh shoot, yeah, this is Aztec, it's ceremonial, it's really important. The archaeologists extended that same trench that the workers had started just for their own work. They found a series of steps, and more and more digging exposed the lower portions of a much larger staircase um, going up a pyramid. Um, it appeared uh, through their investigation that the structure was built in five stages, um, throughout the 15th and early 16th centuries. And these confirmed a lot of hunches that uh, researchers had about where the ruins for the foundations of the great temple of Tenochtitlan were at. Um, the Spanish conquistadors eventually destroyed it in the 16th century, whereupon they built their capital, Mexico City, upon its ruins. Um, but about the same time that the Aztecs were building their empire in Mesoamerica, the Incas established control over much of the Andes in South America. While both the Incan and Aztec peoples um, surpassed earlier civilizations in size, population, and military prowess, they relied heavily on cultural foundations their predecessors had laid. And that's what we're going to talk about at first, is how these things came to be. All right? So you get an idea here, this map is, uh, you might have to zoom in uh, on it here. Tenochtitlan is here. But first, we're actually going to talk about the Mississippian cultural area. Then the Puebloans. And there's the Andes. Okay. Keep in mind, we should always keep these questions in the back of our head. Maybe jot them down on a piece of paper while you're reading so you can refer to them or ask yourself throughout the readings. Um, if you hear some reverb in the background, it's actually my AC, so I apologize for that, but that, that is what it is, we'll get there. So some of the densest uh, populated areas of North America before Europeans came here were in the valleys of the Mississippi, Missouri, Tennessee, and Ohio. Um, their rivers and tributaries were natural conduits of trade, of course. And it was around 800 to 1,000 that the Mississippi, Mississippian people established their settlement of Cahokia. Yeah. 
Um, it is outside of St. Louis, Illinois, and at its zenith between 1050 and 1200 CE, they probably had about 10 to 20,000 inhabitants. Their pottery and stone tools were found in Minnesota, Kansas, Arkansas, Mississippi, um, and they exported salt and a type of rock in exchange for copper, actually, from the Great Lakes. Uh, they traded with Appalachian Native Americans as well, so it had a really vast, vast trading empire at this time. Uh, what they are known for, of course, are their mounds that they built, aka mound builders. Uh, one of which was the Monk's Mound, which was built in stages throughout 900 to 1200. It was probably the residence of Cahokia's ruling class, as well as a ceremonial and administrative center, um, you know, more governmental purposes, probably. But the interesting thing about Mound 72, uh, it gives you an idea how many mounds were out there at this site, um, is aligned with the sunset on the winter solstice and sunset on the summer solstice. Um, so kind of has, you can get an idea of some religious purposes here with Mound 72. Um, also, it was an important burial site because there were the remains of 272 individuals uh, dating to about 1,000 to 1050. Um, some corpses were even buried on litters or platforms or wrapped in blankets, while others were merely just tossed in heaps um, with very little ceremony. You can infer a little bit about their social economic status, perhaps, from the way that somebody was buried. Warfare and environmental degradation probably led to the depopulation of this civilization, and it was eventually abandoned by 1400 in round numbers. If you think about it, this, this population of, uh, what were the numbers again for those, 10 to 20,000 inhabitants, um, it takes a lot to do that. And it takes a lot of uh, deforestation, a lot of um, harvesting woods um, uh, to make proper building materials and such. So uh, it, that meant deforestation probably happened, which ruined the natural habitat, certain plants and animals, depleting, you know, a food source, which is not ideal. So these first civilizations we're going to talk about, the Cahokians, the Puebloans, what else do we have here? The early Maya, the Nahuas, the Caribbean peoples, Amazonians, they always encountered environmental change, and that's something you need to take into account. The environment has been changing since the universe was created. Okay, so let's get an idea of how widespread. These are all mounds that resembled um, that of Cahokia. And it, was, it came from an earlier ideology further down the Mississippi. Much, much older mounds are down here, but you can tell that ideas spread throughout the waterways. And actually, believe it or not, there's one in North Carolina, but I won't know if they actually show it there. So I'm going to show it to you real quick. Let me pull it up. Town Creek Indian Mound. I would be curious if any of y'all have ever been there. It's in the western part of the state, but um, not as big or robust or one might argue that not as important as Cahokia, but you still get an idea. See here, these little children for scale. Um, <clears throat> an idea of how these ideas were spread. Okay? Just wanted to mention that real quick. I thought that was a nice little segue into something more North Carolina related. All right, but let's talk about Puebloans on the Colorado Plateau. Just like those Cahokians, uh, the, these Puebloans built spectacular structures between the 10th and 12th centuries. Uh, they initially lived in like small villages, but they kind of uh, evolved them over time into towns or pueblos. That's what that word means. Each with about five or six stone buildings and something called a kiva, K-I-V-A. And that's a large round covered pit that served as a meeting place and ceremonial center. Um, so it had some really important religious and, like it says here, some ceremonial purposes for this civilization. Uh, excuse me, I'm just taking a drink. Uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico sheltered the densest settlements of these types of pueblos. Um, these first villages probably started popping up around 500 people have dated. Um, 
Pueblo Bonito reached five stories high, the biggest Pueblo area in Chaco Canyon, and had over 600 rooms, which, um, and with estimates that historians have given, probably accommodated 500 to 1,000 residents. Keep in mind that um, the 600 rooms of Pueblo Bonito doesn't mean that that's a bedroom, 600 bedrooms. Uh, many of these people use these storage areas for food surpluses, you know. Think about uh, um, to grow a, popular, uh, a populous people, you need to store lots of food during, uh, during droughts or during environmental change. But what's actually really interesting about Pueblo Bonito Right here, it talks about the division of labor. There were two people in this Pueblo that we can infer from the artifacts they left behind. The quote-unquote winter people who specialized in hunting and gathering. And the quote-unquote summer people who farmed. And that gives you an indication that these people in this environment couldn't solely rely on agriculture. They had to farm, they had to harvest, they had to hunt for food and pelts and warmth, and probably for trading as well. All these things were goods that could be traded. <coughs> um, these Puebloans also had really connected roads. Um, the population grew faster than the, um, than the valley's ecosystem could sustain, unfortunately. Um, probably as a consequence of that, these Puebloan people uh, migrated to distant land areas uh, beyond the plateau, most notably uh, Mesa Verde in southwestern Colorado. And I've actually been there. It's a really beautiful place, carved right into the stone. Um, so once again, you can see how ideas of creating structures to live in were taken with them. Um, and once again, they had an incredible system of roads that literally went straight over hills and straight through valleys and things like that. Here we get an idea. Now, the book was um, brought up an interesting point. And if you look literally at this ancient road diagram of these people, what's going on here? So, Pueblo Bonito is right on the center of Chaco Canyon. Now, one theory that historians, um, historians have pondered is that, oh, well, maybe these roads have very religious um, iconography or symbolic reasons. You see how the roads radiate out. Um, well, maybe the is implying that Chaco Canyon and the settlements here in the middle were, quote-unquote, the navel of their civilization. And uh, I think that's a little far-fetched. I don't know. But regardless, it shows you that how expansive these highways were to allow for trade. But regardless, when once this uh, settlement started to break down, it made it easier for these migrants to move. You see here, that's where Mesa Verde is. So it would have been very easy for these ancient Puebloan, Puebloan people to go north like this. All right, we're going to talk about the Maya, Mystec, and Toltec. Uh, during the 9th and 10th centuries, people fleeing drought-ravaged deserts of northern Mexico and the American Southwest traveled long distances to the greener highland regions of central Mexico. Once again, you have to keep in mind how the environment was changing people's daily lives. They had to move where they could live. The Toltecs were one of the groups that migrated during the 9th century. They settled somewhere called Tula in the center in the valley of Mexico. Basically, just think like where Mexico City is now. <laughs> Excuse me. Tula had two large pyramidal temples surrounded by palaces and residences of priests and government officials. They also had five ball courts. And we're not really sure what those, what those games were about, but they certainly had like a ritual function. Um, just like the other arenas did in other Mesoamerican societies. Now, Tula never really met the, um, let's just say, the imperial state that many other Mesoamerican peoples did. 
but that doesn't take away from the fact that they were able to do some pretty, pretty great things, um, including bringing in commercial influence from the far north and south. Remember, that's where the people were coming from. So they brought their ideas and maybe their connections with them as well. Uh, local traditions tell us that any given day in the market, there would be tons of languages spoken in their market. That gives you an idea of how ethnic, ethnically mixed these people were. After about 900, the Toltecs developed regular trade relations with the Maya state of Chichen Itza, which was more than 800 overland miles east of Tula. Toltec merchants uh, took obsidian, um, like manufactured goods with them, and returned home with loads of salt from the Yucatan coast. But unfortunately, Tula um, suffered some water shortages and an influx of um, and, well, an influx of migrants who were sometimes not too happy. Um, and archaeologists have found evidence that invaders sacked the cities, looted, defaced temples, all sorts of stuff. You know, massacring adults and children. Good stuff. So here's an idea of one of their temples right there. Pretty incredible. And those are steep, steep steps. I would not want to walk up. So let's talk about the Nahua people. The collapse of the Toltec defenses in the Valley of Mexico encouraged, once again, more people from the arid north to infiltrate the region. There, had, there was a power void, just like the PowerPoint says. Many of these newcomers spoke a language called Nahuatl, a language um, in the family tree that also had the Hopi people, the Comanche, and the other North American, Native Americans. Um, in, the in the two centuries following the Toltec fall, there were a bunch of city-states inhabited by the Nahua. Each city-state had a defined territory, a patron deity, and a ruler. Um, that ruler served as a military commander, but also, in addition to having military prowess, had some religious duties as well that went hand in glove with their um, with their community. A typical city had a temple, a palace, other stone buildings clustered around a central plaza that also functioned as a marketplace. Keep that in mind because as we move forward to talking about the Aztec peoples, this is how they organized their cities as well, but on a much grander, grander scale. Um, but the Nahua people actually, it's, it became very evident that there was a rigid social class, social hierarchy in their system, in their society, and it led way for people to be enslaved via, via, um, as well as wartime criminals or wartime contraband, um, as pieces of property that were literally exchanged um, with that. Also, these people, the Nahuas, employed people called the Poke Teca. These were clandestine spies, but most importantly, um, like their rudimentary job was to act as really long distance traders. But like I said, they were able to, because they're long distance, they could travel these to faraway places, get some intel on a rival city state, figure out if somebody's politically weak at that time to you know, take military action or diplomatic action against them. But by the late 15th century, the Valley of Mexico had between 1 and 2.5 million inhabitants. It's kind of hard to nail down a precise number, but regardless, that's a lot of people. Um, keep in mind, these city-states kind of had tribute states around them that exceeded 6 million in population. But because of the social hierarchy that these people created in their civilizations, um, that really provoked a lot of inner city wars over farmland and labor. And sometimes military victors enslaved their neighbors, like I mentioned before, and annexed their lands. Um, often the defeated city would have to pay tribute, of course, turning them into political entities or dependent on their um, on the larger city-state itself. Something else that's defined the Nahuas is the, 
their farming practices where they literally would create flooded, um, irrigatable, agrable land to take advantage of the natural resources, but also to control the flooding that was rampant in Mexico. This allowed families to repeat the process um, of creating these terraces time and time again in order to get the most out of their farmland. So let's talk about the Caribbean and Amazonia. In the lower Magdalena River Valley in modern Colombia, the Bentanchi people constructed mounds that reached up 26 feet. These artificial hills supported temples or entire villages. So once again, uh, an idea of mound construction. Now these people, because they're so far away in Colombia, might not necessarily have learned it from the mound builders of North America in the Mississippian Delta. But regardless, there was something that drew people to this type of construction. Most likely it had to do with their spirituality, right? If you think about what looking up to the heavens meant to these people. But the Batanchi um, had some had a lot of painted pottery and seashells at some of their sites, in addition to really great gold artifacts. East of this area, though, the Terorin, to, Terona population grew rapidly from the 11th century. They probably had the most sophisticated and largest civilization in South America, outside the Andes, which we're about to talk about. Uh, of course, the characteristics you should think about are stone temples and palaces, um, as well as large tombs with lots of gold artifacts buried with the deceased. Um, but let's also talk about the Taino people who dominated the Caribbean islands. Now, the Taino, who were agricultural hunters, fishers, they dominated these islands after about 11,000. And it's pretty apparent that they moved from Hispaniola, which is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, to populate Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and the Virgin Islands. And how did they do so? Via boats, of course. So they had some great um, nautical knowledge. Um, the population of this region probably reached its peak about the 13th century, um, you know, just a couple centuries before Europeans got there. But also we should talk about Amazonians and from the period 900 to 1500 these Amazonians extended trade links with the Andean communities to the west offering gold cocoa medicinal plants dyes and slaves keep in mind slavery existed then in exchange for raw cotton textiles sea salt and dogs from those in the Andes Spanish and Portuguese explorers constantly were talking about how densely settled and populated this region was as late as the late 1600s. And here's a ceremonial um, item from the Taino people, I believe, which is a, uh, a seat where one would enter a um, hallucinogenic state in a ritual ceremony. All right, let's talk about the states of the Andes. Excuse me. Farming and herding people had been building central plazas and platforms around the shores of Lake Titicaca in modern Bolivia uh, for a very, very long time. This lake actually is at an elevation really high up there. It's really unique because the elevation there is 12,500 feet. So farming really couldn't um, rely on corn at that time because corn needed to be a lower elevation. So the people actually farmed potatoes and quinoa, which were able to grow, grow there. Llama and alpaca herds provided food, wool, and transport, of course. Um, the aristocratic elite acquired a lot of prestige and appeared to have um, continually erected new and spectacular temples. Um, lots of things to attract pilgrims, outsiders, people to come move 
there. At its peak in the 10th century, so, you know, 900, um, the city probably had um, about 40,000 residents, while another 75,000 lived in neighboring towns. Uh, there were great platforms faced with stone and uh, a lot of gateways that really dominated their city, which was Tiwanaku. It declined in the 10th century, probably as a result of um, deteriorating environmental conditions once again. The water level of the lake that we just talked about rose suddenly and it like destroyed a lot of farmland, so that's not ideal. But there was also an empire called the Wari people. There were a lot of successive droughts and downpours um, that actually shifted their small-scale farming um, from the valley floors high up into the mountain slopes. They didn't want to have to deal with their fields being inundated. Um, consequently, actually, there was a rise of a minority of noble families who gained a lot of political dominance, um, connected themselves to the staff god, who was an ancient Andean deity um, who had clawed feet, fang teeth, and, you know, was carrying staffs, of course. To ensure a constant food supply, uh, the rulers founded towns throughout the empires as centers of food collection and storage, and they built this, like, really, really great network of roads to connect these towns um, with the capital. And they used things called quipu, Q-U-I-P-U-S, or knotted colored strings as a system of record keeping to send state messages backwards and forwards. Also, we should, should consider the Chimu. Um, their capital was called Chan Chan, and it rose up in the Mochi River Valley amid the ruins um, of an older civilization there. Their territory extended along about 700 miles of coastal plain and valleys and probably had a population of about a quarter million. Pretty incredible if you think about it. A uh, network of roads, once again, roads are so important at this time, connected the city to a lot of vassal cities. And uh, the state resurrected at least part of that old timey tradition of water management using canals and reservoirs, aqueducts, yada, yada, yada. Um, but actually, in addition to carrying water, some of their canals actually didn't carry water to be drunk, but actually carried water away from the cities in case there was flooding. So that's really interesting as, um, um, as flood channels, more or less, is what they were. Um, but also the civilization had a, um, and, um, they, they had ability to raise a labor force through, um, it was kind of like a draft system. Everybody put their name in a, in a ballot to be drawn. They had work to do for the state. And one such thing might be planning for these extreme weather events. The empire continued to grow well into the 1400s, um, but its warriors didn't really push into the mountains too much. It was largely confined to the dry coastal plains. Um, and with the rising Incan empire seizing the highlands, they kind of, the Incans showed a real threat to the Chimu people. The Chimu people also practiced something called split inheritance where, um, I mean, it's kind of what we do today about when a loved one um, writes a last will and testament about splitting up their estate for a family member. Those are the necessary steps to go through to obtain property. So these people practice this as well. So in what ways were the historical development and political and economic institutions of the Aztec and, M and Inca empires similar or different? Keep that in mind as I go through just a brief sketch of who they are. So the founding of the Aztec state was the work of the Mexica, um, one of the um, Nahuatl speaking bands that came into central Mexico that we've already kind of talked about. 
but um, me- Mexico men made a reputation for themselves as skilled and ferocious mercenary fighters. Around 1325, uh, they found a home of their own on two rocky islands in Lake Texcoco in the middle of the valley. And this is going to be the location of the Aztec Empire. In the late 14th century, the Mexica settlements, uh, who were kind of on the margins of the Nahua society, bloomed into thriving cities, one of which being Tenochtitlan. Um, and remember, these are the twin islands on either side of, uh, the, of the lake. Uh, they had some military um, action that needed to be taken, and 428, they had um, a really great military victory and went on to more campaigns of imperial expansion. So give me an idea. Remember Columbus, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean boy. 60 or more years ago, before then, there were great military campaigns happening right here in America. As we've kind of talked about a little bit um, with military exploration at this time, a invading city might dispatch emissaries to offer gifts and other things to entice a surrender. But outside of that, a military battle would take place. Um, and with once again, because they were known for their military prowess, they won lots and lots of battles. They had a lot of influx of trade and tribute from the cities they took over. Um, they grew rapidly as a result during that uh, during the 1400s, and their population, um, the just these two cities, um, their population probably reached close to a quarter million by the time the Spanish got here. Um, they had a lot of really ambitious building projects, such as aqueduct. And we've talked about water and how important that is, increasing uh, the number of causeways or roads, or you might even consider them as highways throughout their growing empire. And of course, the temple of the Aztec people is where we started this whole chapter. Now, the Great Temple had a pyramidal shape and a steep staircase leading up to a platform and two stone huts actually on top of it. Each of the huts was actually for a different god. Um, and I'm not going to try and pronounce their name because I'm going to get it wrong. But one of the gods was the god of rain during the summer and fall, which is also harvest time. You know, think about how important rain is during harvest because plants need it to survive. The other god, the god of war, during the winter and spring. We've already kind of mentioned this ideology of, uh, of the seasons dictating exactly how these people lived. And once again, you get an idea for it because these people literally, literally had two different temples on top of their structure. Um, of course, um, a defining feature about these people was religion and human sacrifice. Uh, human blood as an offering was pivotal in their mythology um, because like we stated before, um, they, they, were some, they had some pretty um, they, they had a lot of militaristic ambitious events that they needed to aspire for um, in every major event actually including childbirth, a battle uh, movement of the sun, praying for the rain and harvest, um, required some sort of sacrifice, and this type of blood, human blood, was necessary. And keep in mind that um, a lot of wartime captives served really well as a source of human blood at this time. And sometimes, actually, cities fought prearranged battles in which each side like agreed to a set amount of captives they wanted to take because they knew they had to sacrifice them or use them in religious ceremonies. 
Um, some historians have argued that uh, Spanish conquistadors exaggerated these sacrifices to like morally justify occupying Mexico. Um, but at the same time, you, the evidence doesn't lie. Uh, there were plenty of human sacrifices where their bodies were thrown from the top of the temple, their heads cut off once their corpses reached the bottom, things like that. All right. So you get an idea of how those cities worked. And keep in mind, um, yeah, their empire was exceedingly large. I mean, it first started off here and grew larger, reaching to the Gulf of Mexico and even the Pacific Ocean on either ends. But it was much more difficult to administer justice or collect taxes or keep people in line who are on the fringes of society, right? Think about how difficult it would be for a government official way over here at the capital to enforce something upon someone here. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the Incas, and then we're going to wrap up. So the Incas traced their origins to uh, an island in, um, in Lake Titicaca, not far from where the Tawanaku civilization had been. Um, and probably the Incas first occupied the region around 1200, and throughout the next two centuries, they kind of took control of kinship groups that were already there. Um, these kinship groups were called A A U A Y L L U. And they managed to preserve a lot of their identity and much of their political and social autonomy. That just means, you know, their their self-being, the things that define them politically and socially. They were able to keep all that. Incan society practice uh, split inheritance, um, just just like the Chimu people did. Um, but by the 15th century, Incan society included several dozen, actually, royal clans. That's how we should think of these people as clans, family clans, um, who actually venerated their mummified remains of a past ruler. Um, so they really took pride in their rulers like that. According to the, the sources we have left, Incan imperial expansion started about 425 or so. Um, when a foreign group actually threatened the capital of Cusco. Um, the Inca founded their domination on skillful combinations of diplomacy and violence, which not dissimilar than the Mexica people. They kind of tended to do more diplomacy because they tried to lavish lords with gifts, aiming to get them to submit without fight, but of course if they had to fight, they totally would. Um, a lot of visiting lords actually brought their own gifts, and they exchanged things, and they exchanged women as concubines and wives, and um, in that way they kind of like, they thought they strengthened bonds of friendship between the families. Um, many Indian, Andean, excuse me, peoples uh, slipped into dependence on the Incas as weak allies, though. And after gaining control of a lot of the valleys, they, um, the Incas set their sights on the Chimu state and its capital of Chan Chan. Now the Inca army captured the king and forced thousands of artisans to relocate to Cusco, bolstering its economy like that. Um, they created a more hierarchical and centralized state than the Aztecs did, though they did not like have like localized self-government as much. And they organized their empire into four sectors, um, which were connected via royal roads that ran outward from the capital, from the palace at the capital. Um, just like before, time and time again, these conquered peoples paid tribute, a lot of times in labor, actually. Um, once again, these men and women could be drafted into the army or work in uh, work gangs that built their stone structures, irrigation systems, and this labor draft, which was modeled on the Wari and Chimu people, was called the Mita system, M-I-T-A. Let's go back here and you can get an idea of, remember, they started here, 
the team move state evolved initially outside of the Andean people, but then eventually all of this was conquered. They had three main components of uh, communication in this empire, which were record keeping roads and also relay runners upon those roads. Um, the Incas, once again, uh, recorded on quipus, which is uh, a device, you know, devised by the earlier Wari Empire. Um, the second component, um, well, think about it. I think I have an image of one. There we go. This is what a quipu looks like. Now, keep in mind, these people didn't have written language like Europeans did. So they used knots, types of knots, on certain lengths of rope, types of rope, colors of rope, to mean different things. Very fascinating, very ingenious and complex ideology here. The second component of their communication was those networks of roads and bridges that I was talking about. Um, of course, they had relay runners who carried messengers, uh, just like the Pony Express, from one town or post to another, um, all day, every day. Um, there were also stations spaced throughout the empire along the major roads, and um, were that this was another way for parcels to be stored, items to be transported. Cusco, um, the capital of Cusco, its design was much like Tenochtitlan. Uh, it reflected their cosmology about the four arterial highways of the empire. And this is where those highways met in the capital. But, of course, they had religious importance as well. But, unfortunately, this civilization kind of started weakening by the time that, um, that Europeans got involved. By the start of the 16th century, the Inca Empire was, was incredibly integrated, though. And regional governors um, and servants reported to Cusco. There were a lot of farmers and herders who preserved their own language and customs. Uh, but nevertheless, the, there were going to be tensions that grew in such an empire, of course, right? And the provinces, indigenous communities resented each other's presence. Uh, keep in mind, um, let me go back to this. this there's a ability for people to be incredibly isolated in this, um, in the Andean region, extremely mountainous, um, a very hostile environment to live at times. Um, so it, is, it literally isolated people at times. But eventually there, way, there ended up being a civil war that resulted from one king's death um, in 1528. Two competing son, sons were literally fought one another to take over. But these political tensions were still like on the surface, when Francisco Pizarro and a bunch of Spaniards appeared out on the sea. And next time we're going to learn about how these Europeans, the things in their background, the things that happened before this, that led Europeans to explore. And there's going to be a lot of different reasons, of course, but you should always keep in mind about what these people, what the Americans, the early, early Americans, what they were going through long, hundreds of years, sometimes a thousand years before Spaniards and Europeans and Portuguese came here. Okay. So I really appreciate um, you all listening today and uh, be on the lookout for a discussion board. All right. And, oh, um, yeah, I've, I'm going to revise my deadline for discussion boards. I originally said Fridays. That's not going to be practical for you guys. That's not going to be fair. So um, I will have all discussion boards due on every Sunday. Okay. And I'm going to try and be more consistent about uploading the lectures. On um, I would like to do them Tuesday night. Might not happen. It might be Wednesday every week. But regardless, I'm going to let you take until Sunday 
to write out a well thought out discussion board response. In addition to responding on two of your classmates, keep that in mind, two of your classmates discussion boards as well.